The vacuum of outer space can really only be called a vacuum by relative measure. Space is simply swarming with inconspicuous particles and is filled with very thin gas. At the speeds necessary to travel space in any kind of reasonable or halfway justifiable amount of time, those thin gases are turned into particle beams bombarding a starship for its entire journey. At those speeds, tiny grains of dust become bombs. It's true enough that grains big enough to do much damage are fairly rare. But for interstellar travel to ever become routine, once in 100 is utterly unacceptable. Would you commute to work with an even a 1 in 1,000 chance of dying? Would an oil rig worker accept a 1 in 100 odds of dying each time they fly out and back? Traveling at third the speed of light, shielding about one-third a meter thick, is required to bring the radiation levels down to an equivalent of those found on the International Space Station. But as modern studies have shown, even these radiation levels are too high, causing brain swelling followed by brain shrinking, resulting in the gradual or rapid onset of Alzheimer's-like symptoms. One wonders about the effects on one's immune system as well. The problem is that if you use high-density materials like metal, the rapidly breaking interstellar gas particles produce a lot of secondary radiation. After all, slamming subatomic particles into metal is precisely how X-ray machines work. If you use low-density materials, especially ones rich in hydrogen, like plastic, you can softly decelerate incoming particles, reducing but not eliminating secondary radiation. Therefore, we have to layer plastic and metals to catch and absorb everything. But that won't help if big grains hit you, though. And that's only traveling a third the speed of light. It would take a whole three years to travel a single light year at this speed, and some 14 years to travel to the nearest completely separate star, Proxima Centauri. The solution is simple. We need to deflect particles and larger debris before they reach the starship, with the minimal resistance possible both to minimize drag, which is not inconsequential at extremely high speeds, and to avoid the production of secondary radiation. In order to deflect gas particles, we must first ionize them so that they can be deflected by electromagnetic fields. Generally, there are three main ways to accomplish this. One, use of foil or a layer of electromagnetically suspended plasma to strip away the electrons from incoming particles. Two, use of very powerful magnetic fields or electric to directly strip electrons away from particles. Three, an ionizing radiation laser, i.e. ultraviolet or higher frequency, to ionize the particles. The first is most commonly considered, hence why we listed it first. The problem with using foil stripper to ionize particles is that the foil suffers gradual ion erosion and is also vulnerable to impacts by larger grains, creating holes that would allow unslowed particles past. A plasma stripper is better, but is still vulnerable to impacts, which would knock away pieces of the plasma sheath, letting radiation in until the plasma fills the holes. However, despite the disadvantages, this technique, perhaps using both plasma and foil sheets, serves as a good backup. The second technique sounds very difficult to achieve, but in practice, all that it requires is a large, highly charged electrode. Charged not much more than the Van de Graaff generators used in modern particle accelerators. At already a few percent the speed of light, an electrode would produce an enormously powerful magnetic field. Remember, a magnetic field is produced whenever there is a changing electric field. In everyday devices, electrons in a wire physically move very slowly. 
though an electric wave travel along a wire nearly at the speed of light. With the starship moving at a few percent the speed of light, or even faster, the magnetic field produced by the large and highly charged electrode will be tremendously powerful and, owning to the starship's speed, having a high frequency. The combination of a very powerful and high frequency magnetic field should ionize most of the particles encountered. Plasma and foil electron stripping systems would serve as a backup. Thirdly, powerful lasers already exist as point defense systems on some modern warships, as well as more powerful ones planned for the future or currently in development. Such lasers will undoubtedly be essential on near-future spacecraft as anti-micrometeoroid point defense grids. Lasers can both help ionize particles in smaller dust grains and either partly ablate or completely vaporize larger dust grains. A starship might also need high-powered particle beams in its prow in the occasional case where a much larger object is encountered and the ship is unable to avoid it in time. Note that many objects in deep space are very dark and we're talking about a starship moving at high fraction the speed of light. Turning is not exactly quick or easy. Ultimately, we would want to use higher order electromagnetic pulses as discussed in our quantum ramjet video, as this can adjust the electric and magnetic strength of the vacuum itself, which would allow us to deflect particles without producing any secondary radiation at all. In this way, particles, radiation, and even fields would glide off and pass the starship without giving any resistance at all, permitting the starship to attain the highest possible speeds without resistance or danger. Many of you might wonder about the possibility of using a warp field to deflect debris. Configured correctly, this is certainly possible, but is not very energy efficient. A starship has a fixed energy budget. Even a quantum radjet can only extract a finite amount of energy in a given amount of time. By using more efficient techniques to deflect debris, more energy is available per unit of time to achieve higher acceleration and therefore a shorter travel time. And that concludes this video. As always, thank you for watching and keep wandering about space. Thank you.